Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is John Campia, and this is Mailbag. What is Mailbag? Well, I'm glad that you asked. See, every day on the John Campia Show, Monday through Friday, we take the second half of the show to take live comments and questions from our audience who are watching live. However, what if you're one of those people who watches the show one of the other 22 hours during the day? Well, good news. That's why we have Mailbag for you guys who don't watch the show live, maybe because it's a different time zone or you're at work or whatever. And here's how you send in a question to be on Mailbag. Simply go down to the description of this video and you'll see a tip link. Click on that there, or you can enter it in manually at www.streamelements.com slash movieblogtv slash tip. You'll be getting your comment or question read on Mailbag if we deem your comment or question appropriate to be used on Mailbag. And of course, you'll be supporting our channel at the same time. And all of us involved here at The John Campus Show, thank you guys so very much for your support. And as you can tell, I am now in my new office. Uh, this weekend, we struck down the office and studio that was in my converted garage and me and fact checker Jonathan and Ray and Rob and my buddy Ryan, who's been helping us out, have been moving everything into our brand new studio and offices. And this is my new office. It's not all set up yet, uh, but it's at least set up just enough for us to do mailbag here. And uh, then tomorrow, Monday, we're gonna do the John Campus show from my office. The stage and studio is not ready yet. Uh, I won't be ready until for another week or so after we get back from Vegas. But me and Rob are gonna do uh, the John Campus show from our offices here. And uh, then you're gonna have to wait to see the main stage. And then right after we're done that, me, Rob, Ray, Aaron and Chris, we all head out to Vegas for CinemaCon, which we're very, very excited about. So uh, yeah, but for now, guys, let's get things kicked off here with the first mailbag, the first video of any kind from our brand new offices here. So uh, let's get things started here. And we're going to get things started off with Brian Rogers. And Brian Rogers writes, Indy 5, John Wick 4, MI7, Flash, Aquaman, Marvels, and now this Push to 2023. We're running out of movies this year. Uh, plus, I'm concerned. Why don't we have a specific release date for Borderlands? Uh, I like a good ragtag action team, and I want to see all, all, all I want to see is a release date. Well, I mean, as far as look, for as far as a lot of movies getting pushed into 2023 goes, we talked for a long time while the pandemic was going on that we were going to see consequences of the pandemic on scheduling long after the main part of the pandemic's done, right? Because you don't get to shut down production and remove a lot of release dates for movies that now all have to get shoved into further uh, coming years without there being a lot of chaos. And, you know, each individual project just has its own problem, but don't worry, there's still lots of movies coming this year. As far as Borderlands, eh, I mean, I, I don't know what the rush to know a release date is. They'll they'll tell us a release date when they think they've got a release date. Like, I'd rather them tell us a release date when they know they've nailed down when they want that movie to come out, rather than tell us a release date that they're 90% sure about and then later have to move it. You know what I'm saying? So we'll get a release date for Borderlands sooner or later. Don't worry about that, Brian. All right. Thanks for sending that in, man. Next up, Murray Reich writes, I saw Ambulance, and all I've got to say is, it's not a great movie. No, it's not. Terrible dialogue, yes. Uh, so much shaky cam and weird camera angles, but I will say is the action is great. So overall, I had a fun time. Well, listen, you can say it's not great, but if you had a fun time, that's really all that matters, right? Like, I talk a lot on the show about the fact that uh, really when it all comes down to it, the only thing that really matters is what was your experience at the movie? And if you had a great experience, at the end of the day, that's it. Nothing else matters in that. And whether it's great dialogue, bad dialogue, whatever, if your experience was good and you were entertained and had a good time, that's all there is to it. Now, me personally, the negatives outweighed the positives for me. And I, unfortunately, I didn't hate Ambulance, but I kind of couldn't wait to get out of the theater either at the same time. But the important thing is you had a good time, and that's what matters, man. All right, next up. We've got Lars who writes, I saw everything everywhere all at once on Saturday and my brain keeps going back to Rakakuni. Well, I'm not going to talk about that, obviously, because I don't want to give away spoilers. But Lars, that is my favorite movie of the year so far. 
I mean, that might change once I see Doctor Strange or Thor or, or Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent, which I'm going to go see tonight finally. I wanted to see it earlier this weekend, but we've been so busy trying to get everything moved into the studio. It's, it's taken up most of my time. But hopefully I'll be able to do that uh, tonight. Ann and I have tickets for tonight, so I hope I can go. Uh, but yeah, right now, Everything Everywhere All Once is my favorite movie of the year. I'm glad you saw it, man. All right, next up, Devin writes, Hey, John slash Rob, just me today. I see the Batman on HBO last night. I'll be straight up. In my opinion, it's still enjoyable. Uh, in all three hours, uh, in my top three favorite scenes is the Riddler interrogation. Now, that's a great scene. So spine tingling and intense. What are your favorite scenes? Thanks for your time. Well, one of my favorite scenes, I, well, first of all, like I, it should still be a great experience. Like if it's a good movie, it's going to be a great experience in the movie theaters or on the TV. I haven't watched it on HBO yet. So I, I can't really say what my watching it on a television experience has been. I'm sure it's still going to be great, but I'm also pretty sure it's not going to be as good as the movie theater. Like being in that movie theater, seeing it on that size of screen, plus, you know, when you get something like the Batmobile and the rumbling and all that kind of stuff, it's just better in a theater. But I haven't seen it on the on uh, HBO yet, but I, I will definitely because I love this movie. What's my favorite scene in it? I don't, I probably has to be almost anything with Penguin in it. Like, I just love what Matt Reeves did with that character. And obviously Colin Farrell played it so great. So particularly the first meeting between Batman and Penguin or even the interrogation between Batman and Penguin. Those were really, really good too. All right, next up, we've got uh, also Devin who writes, one of two. Unpopular opinion, but in my personal opinion, I admittedly know the Fast franchise hasn't always been steady to say the least. However, I'm a huge Fast fan and my mindset is this. For any film, bad or good, it continues to make lots of money. It should it should continue. I respect you guys and others out there uh, may disagree, but film is subjective. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Aquaman and Captain Marvel, let's ride or die. This could be the start of Marvel versus DC. Well, clearly not the start of Marvel versus DC. Now look, I thought Fast 9 was an abysmally terrible movie, just awful. And I say that, if you've watched me for any period of time, I say that as somebody who has loved Fast 5, Fast 6, Fast 7. I even quite liked Fast 8. I mean, not as much as the previous ones, but I even quite liked Fast 8. And I gave all of those positive reviews and love this franchise, and I love Vin Diesel. But yeah, for me, it just, 9 was... Like I said, it was a, it wasn't just bad. It was abysmally terrible. Now, does that mean I think this franchise is done? No, they had a bump in the road. <laughs> no pun intended, but they had a bump in the road, right? In my opinion, they, they rifled off like five, six, seven, eight, four. If you want to count four, they rifled off like five really solid movies in a row. In my opinion, they can easily get things back on track. I think Fast 10 could easily get things back on track. They could also make it worse than 9, but I've still got faith in it, and I'm with you. Listen, if the audience is still enjoying the movies, and if they still make money, and if the cast and crew still enjoy making them, I say keep making them till Fast 20. It doesn't matter. As long as they're making it, like, now look, if they crank out two or three Fast 9s in a row, then yeah, I'm going to say kill it. But yeah, for now, keep it going, man. By all means, keep it going. All right, next up. Devin writes again. Hey, John, I saw a few weeks ago prior to the first episode of Moon Knight's release. Every time I see people short forming it to MK, I always want to say Mortal Kombat. Anyway, uh, of Moon Knight's release that Oscar Isaac sung a goofy song called Hippopotamus uh, on Jimmy Fallon. I could be dead wrong, but is that just a coincidence? Uh, could he have been hinting at something? Episode four ending? Eh. I'm going to go out on a limb and say probably not hinting at anything. It probably was just a silly song. Like, for example, I remember when um, when uh, Spider-Man, the first Spider-Man movie had its, I can't remember which order it came out, but I think it was when the first Spider-Man movie came out and it was called Homecoming. And everybody said, oh. One of the key trigger words for Winter Soldier was homecoming. Remember, he's a duh, duh, duh. Homecoming was one of the trigger words. It's like, that means there's a connection. And clearly there wasn't. So, I mean, I don't know. There might be, but I'm going to guess there's not, Devin. At least that's just a guess. I'm going to have to go and look at that video footage, though, because I didn't know he did that. That sounds like a lot of fun. Okay, next up. Sino 10101 writes, 
I just ordered some candies from Bruce's Candy Kitchen. Thanks to Rob's recommendation. Yeah, Rob was talking about that on the show today. Uh, now I just need a Rob action figure that says his cat phrases. Bruh, my God, come on. Uh, we park our shuttlecraft in the same shuttle bay. Yeah, Rob's got a number of... Um, uh, there's. I want to add one more to that. What's not to love? That's another one of his big catches. Because yes, he says, all. if you had took a shot... If you want a little drinking game for the John Campy show, for like for me, it's, I mean, the obvious ones is um, uh, next up or Chris or, you know, I've got a whole bunch of them myself. For Rob's, they would definitely be brah or my God. But you definitely got to add, you got to add one more to there. You've got to add the, uh, what one did I just say? You got to add, oh, now I forgot what I said. You've got to add, oh yeah, what's not to love? Yeah, drinking game for Rob, you'll be smashed by the end of the episode. All right, next up, we've got Luke, I am your plumber, who writes, how about Screen Click for a new name? Nah. Uh, it's a play on Shawn Michaels. Yeah, Shawn Michaels and Friends WWE and a remote control. Have a great day. Yeah, I don't know. It's There have been a couple of interesting name suggestions that people have written in, like, but about 80% of them have the word either screen or cine in it. And Click. I, I don't know that I like the click. I don't know why I want my name of my show to have a 1980s, early 90s WWE <laughs> reference, to be honest with you, Luke, I'm your plumber. But full marks for a very cool screen name. All right, next up. Uh, Chloe Fanning writes, uh, show name suggestion, The Serial. I, I, hmm? A wide variety that people can enjoy 24 hours a day. Uh, people all over the world can sit down enjoying a bowl of cereal while watching The Serial. I'm going to lean against that one. I mean, creative thinking process there. I'll, I'll give you that creative thinking process. But yeah, I think I'm going to I'm going to lean away from the serial as a name there, Chloe. But thank you for the suggestion. All right. Next up, Tom E. writes, hey, John, I just wanted to throw one more suggestion for a show idea. Everybody's got show ideas uh, into the hat. How about all that screen stuff? Again, another one with screen in it. Uh, strike you. Encompasses everything and keeps a very distinctive campia flavor and all that stuff. Uh, without That's another one I, you could use for a drinking game. Uh, without using your actual name, in my opinion. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you, brother. I'm not a huge fan of it. Mm. I'll tell you, though, I haven't come up with a name that I like any better than that one either. Like I, This is the thing. I have not come up with any good names. Like a month and a half ago, the idea was that we were going to have a new show name by the time we move into the studio. Well, guess what? We're moving into the studio and I never came up with a good name. So yeah, I'm not, I don't think really all that screen stuff rolls off the tongue to be honest with you. But again, it's it's as good or better than any of the ideas I've had, Tom. All right, next up. Uh, Nick A writes, uh, hey, John, love the show. Thank you very much. Watch every day. I have a name suggestion. No, really? Uh, but I can't take credit for it because you say it every day. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth. Uh, can use that or change it to entertainment show. No, entertainment show is not a good idea. And th there's two problems with this suggestion. Number one, it's way too long. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet. Like this way too long. But the other thing is that there was a sports show. I think it was like on Fox Sports or whatever like years ago. And I think Jimmy Kimmel was the host of it or one of the hosts of it years ago. And I think it was called the best damn sports show. So I don't think I'd want to use that in the title of my show, if you know what I'm saying. All right. Thanks a lot for the suggestion, Nick. Next up, Gnome writes, one of two. Hey, John, as a very big Potterhead, I love Fantastic Beasts 3, and I think it was the best of the three. Jude Law and Mads had fantastic chemistry on screen, and there is a lot of story to be told further. I very much hope that movies 4 and 5 will release, especially because in the coming years of the timeline, the story with Voldemort, Hagrid, and the Chamber of Secrets is supposed to take place. What do you think will happen next, and will it even happen according to the box office numbers so far? Love the show, and cheers from Israel. Well, thank you so much for writing it from Israel, Noam. Um, yeah, look, I loved, Fan well, uh, I really, really liked Fantastic Beasts 3. I really liked it. I I've seen it twice now. And I enjoyed it even more the second time. I think it's easily the best of the Fantastic Beast films so far. Uh, I thought it was quite good. I really enjoyed it. I don't think they're going to do another one, despite the fact that it came out of the gates pretty strong internationally. Um, it hasn't really been able to keep up the legs. As a matter of fact, let me just pull up the box office here just for a second. Hold on a second. Okay, so here's the thing. After three weeks, the movie's made $280 million worldwide. Now, for most films, that's a really good, solid 
uh, performance at the box office. But the two problems are, this isn't just any franchise, right? It's Fantastic Beasts, and this is something that the Fantastic Beasts box office has been dwindling, and the fact that this was a $200 million production budget. Now, again, we won't go all into it right now, but you said, but it's made 280. That means it's been profitable. No, because then you got to add on top of that about another 50 million in, in uh, marketing budget. So you're really looking at about $250 million they spent on this. And that 280 million, now you got to take away about a third of that for the movie theaters to keep. So if I was going to do some quick math here, let me, let me bring up because I'm not really good at this right off the top of my head. So some quick math, we've got this. So uh, 280 million dollars minus say 33 percent and so you're looking at the movies really made about 187 million dollars so far on a budget including marketing of 250. so these guys are right now if, if fantastic beast ended its run right right now it would be almost 70 million dollars in the hole and it's already done its first three weeks and movies make the vast majority of their money in the first couple of weeks. So it looks like Fantastic, I mean, I don't wanna jinx it and maybe it can have a surge, but it looks like Fantastic Beasts 3, the sequels of Dumbledore is going to lose money. And does Warner Brothers wanna continue with this particular part of the franchise, Fantastic Beasts, if it's losing money? There is a possibility because, like I said, I think the third one is the best one. I think if they made another one, it would make more money than this one. But still, I think right now the possibilities of this move of this franchise getting a fourth film at this point is probably and unfortunately probably pretty doubtful right now. So uh, anyway, let's keep our fingers crossed, man. All right. Next up, we've got He's Crafty who writes. Just wanted to show some support. Thank you, He's Crafty. Uh, love the show, but I work nights on the East Coast, and I'm always sleeping during the live show. No problem, man. Uh, thought a good name for the show could be The Call Sheet. That's not bad. Or The Daily Call Sheet. I prefer the first, like, shorter the better, in my opinion. Keep up the awesome work. You know what? That's, I'm going to put The Call Sheet as one of the better names we've had. To, I, 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 I'm not saying we're going to go with it, but I'd say that's probably in the top 10 of the better name suggestions that we've had so far. Anyway, he's crafty. Thank you so much for checking out our, our show, even if you can't watch it live. Thank you for being a lawyer, loyal viewer and a part of our community, man. And thanks for sending in the suggestion, dude. And of course, thanks for the support. Okay, next up, Devin writes, Hey, John and or Rob, just me today. Uh, I saw The Northman and oh my God, this film is by far one of the most intense, gruesome and visually graphic films I've seen in a long time. I put it in my top 15 to 20 best films this year. Well, that's not saying much. <laughs> best. It's only it's only April and you're only saying it's in the top 15 or 20. I don't even know if there have been 20 good films this year. Okay, uh, the, the Skarsgård is terrifyingly terrific. Your thoughts? Yeah, I we put up our review of uh, The Northman the other day, both my right out of the theater review and of course our uh, fuller review that we did during the John Campus show. I really like this film a lot. I, to me, it's my third favorite film of the year. Like right now for me, the way it ranks out is um, Everything Everywhere All at Once is my number one film of the year. The Batman is number two. And right now The Northman is my number three. I, I had a great time watching this and and I both want to go back and watch it again. And you're right. Alexander Skarsgård is absolutely phenomenal in this thing. This guy's an Academy-level actor, and it's uh, just great to see him do stuff like this. All right, thanks for, uh, for adding that in, Devin. Next up, Snakes Pilskin, Plis Pliskin writes, uh, Thoughts on another Escape from New York sequel? Bad idea. Uh, I love the originals, and I'd like to see the story expanded on. Could be like Blade Runner 2049, where the story is picked up years later, and Kurt Russell is an older snake uh, helping the younger lead actor. I don't see it happening. I don't like, and you really can't compare, you know, Escape from New York and then it's follow up Escape from LA uh, with Blade Runner 20, 2049. They were two completely different movies that were looked at very differently as well. You know, Blade Runner 2049 was considered like, I'm not a fan of Blade of the first Blade Runner movie, just so you know. I'm very, very unique amongst my circle of friends that I don't like the original Blade Runner. Everybody else in the world does. As a matter of fact, it's one of the most beloved, cherished, and celebrated sci-fi classics of all time. And it's very different from the way, you know, Streets, Streets of New York, Escape from New York is kind of looked at. I, and you know, then after Escape from New York, you, we can't pretend like Escape from LA didn't happen. And I just don't think there is the nostalgia factor. I don't think there's the desire for it. So to be honest with you, 
I really don't think they'd be doing another Escape from New York at this point. I, I, and I don't really think there would be a lot of interest in it, to be honest with you. But that's, hey, maybe I could be wrong about that, Snake. The important thing is you still have the original movies you can go back and watch anytime you like. All right, next up. Physical Media Lover writes, I haven't heard this one mentioned yet, but I think the training montage for Thor 4 should be ACDC's Thunderstruck. I think it'd be funny if it becomes Thor's favorite song and he annoys Star-Lord by playing it all the time. You know what? That That's so obvious, I can't believe I haven't thought of that. Like, I've been thinking, I've been wanting Eye of the Tiger by Survivor, right? But that's Thunderstruck for Thor? That is kind of perfect physical media lover. I don't know why I didn't think of that before. I vote with you. I vote that that should be their song for the, like, we'll find out what the training montage and the workout montage music is going to be. But for now, I vote with you. I think your idea is the best one I've heard so far. All right. Timothy writes, Disney has so many franchises that they can make into TV spinoff shows for Disney Plus, yet they don't accept with Marvel and Star Wars. At some point, Disney Plus has to branch out. They could make Pirates of the Caribbean related shows, Tron shows, Avatar shows, etc. Well, they are looking at expanding out Pirates of the Caribbean. They've got a couple of uh, Pirates of the Caribbean spinoffs that they're working on, not as shows, but as movies right now. So they are working on that. And, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean is something that could expand out pretty quick. Tron, I don't think so. Um, for, for two reasons, honestly, I don't think Tron is all that popular. And number two, that's, would be an expensive show to make, which leads us into Avatar. Avatar is ridiculously cost prohibitive, like ridiculously cost prohibitive. And there's really not like with Marvel, you've got this world of characters, right? A world of characters going back decades and decades and decades and decades. With Star Wars, you're in an infinite universe with Tons of stories you could tell and blah, blah, blah. Even with Pirates of the Caribbean, like there could be a lot of different pirates sailing the seas you can meet with. With Avatar, it's a very specific kind of story. I mean, maybe the second film will change that perception. But like the first Avatar is about these characters specifically. It's really not about a wider universe per se. But the main thing though is cost and expense. You, you just can't do an Avatar series um, it'd just be far, far too expensive. So, and you know, they're going to make tons of money on the new movie. So, but Hey, listen, after avatar two and avatar three, we'll see where they go with those stories. And, and maybe a series at that point becomes more feasible. You never know. All right. Thanks a lot for saying that in Timothy. Next up, we've got Jason H who writes Dr. Strange two theory. We will see, uh, both, I thought that was meant to be an acronym. We will see both live action Professor X's. Uh, we know Stuart is in the Illuminati. I think Wanda will wreck them all. And when the X-Men uh, cross from the animated uh, universe, uh, Ma uh, McAvoy's Professor X will join Magneto when he swoops in to take Wanda. Um, You know, I really don't think so. I, I remember I brought up the, hey, maybe they could have both Professor X's in a conversation once and a friend of mine gave me a really good reason why that wouldn't happen and now I can't remember what it was. But anyway, uh, I don't think I don't think we're going to see that. But in a movie like Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, there's no way you could say that's impossible. It very well could be possible. Will it happen? Uh, I, I don't know about that, but we will find out, man. We will find out. I would personally kind of like, I love James McAvoy's Professor X. Not as much as... Um, Patrick Stewart's Professor X, but I really do love McAvoy's version of it as well. All right, next up, we've got Nick Whitaker who writes, I have a theory on your leaked images from most recent Spider-Man, particularly the ones that you didn't show and you realized weren't for Spider-Man. This person in a mocap suit that we would never guess, my theory is Bruce Campbell is Mysterio. Well, number one, I, I don't know why people write in and ask me what it was because I'm not going to give you any hints as to what it was. Look, for those of you who don't know what he's talking about, you guys remember back in late 2021, um, I got a bunch of Spider-Man No Way Home images sent to me that I thought were fake. And I started posting a couple of them and I had a couple of more I was going to post. And then I got contact said, uh, I'm pretty sure those pictures you got are real. I'm like, no, they're not real. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the pictures you got are real. And so I immediately deleted them. I deleted them like within 10 minutes of putting them up. I never made a single video about them. I, I just deleted it, blah, blah, Turns out they were real and my bad. But 
I did let people know that there were two others. Now I've shown those pictures to like Robert and uh, and 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 uh, uh, Chris and has seen it and stuff like that. But I, I did not share those. When I watched Spider-Man No Way Home, I realized those two pictures that I didn't show people weren't in the movie. To which Robert and I instantly went, oh my God, that means blank. We were like, oh my God, that wasn't in this movie. That means those pictures are blank. And we have never said what they are. I have told people that I will reveal what they were after the TV show or movie that they are going to be in airs or releases. After that happens, we will tell people what the images were. But for now, I'm not going to confirm or deny it was Bruce Campbell. I'm not going to confirm or deny it was Wesley Snipes. I'm not going to confirm or deny it was anybody. Um, just like that. But once it comes out in theaters, then I will reveal uh, what it was after everybody's already seen it. At that point, I'll, I'll do that. All right. Thanks a lot for sending that in, Nick. All right. Next up, uh, Captain Bodie writes, Hey, John, how did you like the Fantastic Beast premiere, uh, a.k.a. The Northman? I don't know what that means. Uh, was special seeing a local celebrity. Got a new show title for you. Hi, I'm John Campion. Welcome to, to Beyond the Studio. Q Rob Star Trek tie-in. Uh, nah, I, I'm not a big fan of Beyond the Studio. That that doesn't work for me. But I'm, I'm not quite sure what you mean by... Now, I'm assuming you ran into me at either that Fantastic Beast screening or a Northman screening. Um, but I don't know I don't know what you mean by the Fantastic Beast premiere, a.k.a. the Northman. Not quite sure what you mean by that, Captain Bodie, but thanks for writing in, man. All right, next up. Metalhead writes, uh, Thor theory. End credits will show us the MCU version of Hercules' thoughts. I don't think so. I mean, Rob's brought that up too, and it's definitely a possibility, especially with the fact that we see Olympus and we see Zeus and all that kind of stuff. So it totally is reasonable that we very well could see Hercules. I'm going to guess we're not, but I wouldn't put any money against it. But I'm going to guess right now we won't. We'll, we'll find out very soon. That movie's just like two months away. It's crazy. Like they just released the trailer. It snuck up on everybody. The movie's just like two months away. I cannot wait. I am officially more excited for Thor Love and Thunder than I even am for Doctor Strange 2. And y'all know how excited I am for Doctor Strange 2. So we'll see how that goes. All right, next up. Edgar writes, even though Affleck was perfect as Batman, Josh Brolin would have been good also. Absolutely, completely agree. Uh, but never thought we would be running, uh, he would be in the running for Batman. I was more thinking of John Hamm at the time. How about you guys? Well, I know John Hamm, I remember a lot of people were looking at John Hamm for Superman. Like a lot of people thought Hamm would have been a good Superman choice. And there's definitely some something to be said for that. I love John Hamm, by the way. If you didn't see him in Baby Driver, he's awesome in that. But he's awesome in everything he does. I love I love the guy. Um, but it's a great example of if Josh Brolin had been Batman. Because like one of my pet peeves with our film community and, and my fellow film fans is that this notion that, oh, nobody could play that role except this person, right? And I always say, no, you only say that because that's the only person you saw play the role. And this is a great example of that because if Josh Brolin had played Batman, it would have been great. He would have been great as Batman. But I already know there would have been a lot of people say, oh, no one could have played Batman but, but Josh Brolin. Well, in that alternate universe, we never knew that Ben Affleck was in the running to play Batman, and he would actually end up being my favorite Batman of all time. Um, because even a lot of people who don't like those, those particular DCEU movies that Ben Affleck's Batman appeared in, even a lot of those people who didn't like those films go, yeah, but Ben Affleck's pretty good as Batman, you know? And we never would have known. That's why whenever somebody says, oh, only this person could play this role, I go, mm, no, that's not true. We only say that because that's who we saw. There could have been 20 other people out there who might have done it just as well, maybe even better. We'll never know. So it's just enough that we appreciate it was. But, you know, I think Brolin would have been a really neat choice as well. But as far as John Hamm, I think, I, again, I think I remember the conversation about him more revolving around a potential Superman. All right, next up. We got Moist Twinkie who sends in a $20 Super Chat badge. Thank you, man, who writes... 
Uh, there is a rumor going around stating that the Illuminati members will be Mr. Fantastic, Clea, Black Bolt, Captain Marvel, Captain Carter, along with Professor X. What are your thoughts? Thanks for bringing on the filthy. Well, here's the thing. There's a rumor going around for everything. There's a rumor going around that Wesley Snipes' blade is going to be on the Illuminati. There's a rumor going around that, um, uh, what was the more ridiculous one that I heard? I, I can't remember. Th th there's tons of rumors going around. I generally don't really comment on rumors because anybody can make up anything they want and throw it out there. I will say this. All of these are names that have been floated around in a lot of different combinations of rumors. Um, I believe it's a known fact that Clea is going to be in this movie. Um, I I mean, a lot of people think Mr. Fantastic is going to be there. Black Bolt, again, with the whole Inhumans thing, that's the bigger question mark to me. I don't know if, if Kevin Feige, and I'm saying I don't know. I don't know that Kevin Feige wants to touch anything in humans with a 100-foot pole, but obviously in the comics, Black Bolt is a member of the Illuminati. That's possible. Uh, Captain Marvel, certainly possible. Captain Carter, we know Captain Carvel's gonna, Carter's going to be in the movie, so that's definitely a possibility. Like, we know for a fact that Captain Carter's going to be there because her shield is on the Doctor Strange poster, so... That makes that pretty clear. And we already know that Professor X says, is. There's been a bunch of other names float around there. Namor has been one of the names float around out there as well. So eh, let's just wait and see. But as far as just rumors go, again, there's a million rumors put out every five minutes. So we'll see Moist Twinkie. I can't kill her name. Uh, we'll, we'll see. And again, thanks a lot for saying that, man. And thanks for supporting our channel on that level, man. $20 tip is really generous, dude. Thank you so much for that. All right. All right. Next up, uh, we've got uh, Mike Who, who writes... In Avengers Age of Ultron, we witnessed Thor and Iron Man get Scarlet Witched, uh, and they both had visions that teased Thanos' arrival. Do you think that Multiverse of Madness or Thor 4 is most likely to tease our future big bad, i.e. Liam Neeson as Galactus? Um, I don't know. By the way, I, I've said this before, and people did not like that I said it, but I, but I stand by it. I do not like the idea of Galactus being a big bad. It's just, like, here's the thing. The best villains in the MCU are great characters, right? With great interactions and great dialogue and great motivations, whether you're talking about Loki or you're talking about Thanos or, or, or whatever, these are your best villains, right? You're not going to be standing around in a room with Galactus having an interesting conversation. Like Hulk can't go up and punch Galactus, I, I mean, Galactus is more of a concept to me. Well, John, in the comics, he has these... Yeah, 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 I know, but I don't know that that plays out as well here. Now, again, if Kevin Feige does it, then I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt that it works. But my my personal first preference would not be to have Galactus. So take Galactus out of it for a second. Do I think Doctor Strange or Thor 4 could point to our next big villain? Because I don't think it's Kang. I mean, Kang is coming, but I don't think Kang is the next Thanos. Um, I'll say, yeah, I think they could, but who that is going to be, I don't know yet, Mike. I don't know. All right, next up, Ian writes, have fun at CinemaCon in Vegas. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to it. I'll be there next week for the NFL draft. Is that happening in Vegas? That's pretty cool. So that's going on in the same week. Yeah, I'm. me and the guys, we are so excited for CinemaCon. I, we're leaving tomorrow to go there. I always have such a blast at this thing. I cannot wait to watch the new Top Gun movie. I'm very, I cannot wait to watch the new Ethan Hawke movie, The Black Phone. I cannot wait to find out what the third surprise screening is going to be. I cannot wait to see all the footage and hear the announcement. I mean, it's just going to be a great time. I cannot wait, Ian. All right. Have fun in Vegas while you're there, man. All right. Next up, Garden Variety Vagabond writes, one of two. Hey, team. On the topic of unreleased movies and TV shows, the great original run of Doctor Who is one of my is one of many BBC shows that had a sad issue. BBC did not see that keeping copies as important, and they destroyed the originals. Really? Uh, this impacted 97 episodes currently, especially from the first and second Doctor. Many have been found in odd places, such as in unused closets, in BBC partners, in Africa, in other remote places. That's interesting. It reminds me of the posting uh, of the notice for the, and there's a third part here, uh, for the posting notice of the interplanetary bypass at the local office on Alpha Centauri. It was on display in the bottom of a locked filing cabinet stuck in a disused a laboratory with a sign on the door saying, beware of the leopard. Um, okay, that, that seems to be it. it was, okay, that's it. All right. So 
number one, that is a fascinating story that the, the first couple of seasons of Doctor Who were missing and that they just luckily came across some of them in some weird and odd places. That's a very, very cool story. It almost feels like that deserves to have a documentary made about it if one hasn't already been made. Listen, I, I will confess, you guys know this, I'm not a Doctor Who viewer, right? Like, I'm not saying it's bad. I just don't watch it. That's it. Now, I used to watch some early Doctor Who when I was a kid. Like, I would watch some reruns and stuff like that. But I have not kept up on Doctor Who, like, at all. I, I honestly could not tell you when the last time I watched an episode of Doctor Who was. So I have absolutely nothing to offer this conversation. But again, that story about missing episodes and just luckily some people had them in closets. I think that's fascinating. I totally think a documentary should be made about that. Even though I don't watch Doctor Who, I would watch that documentary. All right. Thanks for sending that in, man. Next up, we've got Downey Downey Jr. who writes, name idea, the main topic show. No. Uh, or just main topic. Main topic's not bad. I don't like show with the word show in it unless it specifically identifies who's in the show. For example, the John Campius show. That makes sense. But I wouldn't watch, I wouldn't want a title that's just like the screen discussion show or uh, movies on file show or whatever. Like if, if Christian wanted to make a, another show and it's called The Christian Harloff Show, I'd be okay with show being in the title because it's the, the title is also the identifier who the star is. That's cool. But main topic, the main topic's not bad. The only weakness I see with it is that it could be about anything. Like we literally could be talking about, you know, this week in calculus and the show's called Main Topic, right? But uh, but Main Topic's punchy. I, I kind of dig that one, Downey Downey. Thanks for the suggestion. All right, next up. Garden Variety Vagabond writes, okay, I will carefully say this. The picture of Chris Carr today, this was obviously sent in the other day, of Chris Carr today was adorable. Is that a safe and respectful way of saying it? I see that it is also on her IMDb page. Great glasses game since Rob gets called out for his t-shirt game. Yeah, no, Chris has a very strong glasses game. Yeah, like I think her best headshots, I've told her this before, I think her best headshots, because she's got a bunch of official ones, are the ones she's wearing glasses. Like some people can pull off glasses, I cannot. Um, but that's why I always look kind of ridiculous when I wear mine. But uh, Chris definitely has a strong glasses game. All right, next up, El Stu Durino writes, Hey, John and crew, greetings from England. Well, thank you for writing in from England, man. Been a fan for over 12 years. Thank you so much, dude. Name suggestion for the show, The Cut. Uh, keep up the good work, folks. The Cut's not bad. That's not a bad, not one of my favorite ones, but that's not a bad one. At least you don't have cine or screen or whatever in it. So yeah, I'll give you points for that one else too. Hey, by the way, 12 years, man. Thank you so much for watching for that long. And thank you for writing in all the way from England. I got to get to England one of these days. We have so many John Campus Show viewers in England. And I've always wanted to go there and do like a, a meet and greet or a live show recording or something like that in England. Someday, someday, I'm going to get around to doing that. Uh, thanks for writing in, Elstu. Appreciate that, man. Brad Jobson writes, uh, show name idea. Uh, Mavens of Media. Nah, I don't like that one. Uh, trying to come up with something that hasn't been used. It's not easy. Dude, tell me about it, Brad. I've been trying to come up with an idea for months. I haven't come up with a single good idea. Not a single one. I've heard some decent ideas. I've heard some decent ideas. I have not been able to come up with one myself. Not big on uh, Mavens of Media, but you're right, man. It's, it's tough trying to come up with something that sticks. It really is. Thanks for the suggestion anyway, Brad. All right, next up. Uh, Sal uh, Kater Achia writes, one of three. Hey, John, first, easiest way to say my last name is Kateranikia. Kateranikia. All right, thank you for giving me the, uh, this, the way to say it, man. Second, I don't know if it was intentional or coincidence, but I noticed in Moon, again, I want to say Mortal Kombat, in Moon Knight Episode 2, Steven's, doctor, uh, Steven's door number is 502. This might interest Rob because issue five or two in the comics is Avengers Disassembled, Chaos, uh, and he just reread it recently. That involves Doctor Strange, Wanda, and her chaos magic, and they are together in a movie coming out very soon after Moon Knight ends. Arthur also tells Stephen he sees chaos in him in episode one. Coincidence or a little nod to the movie coming out? Uh, what could happen with Moon Knight eventually? Thanks, P.S. Uh, these were supposed to go on Super Chats yesterday, but I messed up. Well, no problem about that. Um, 
listen, we have seen in a number of already of the Marvel Disney Plus shows that little homages and references has been left in apartment numbers, um, in uh, license plates, in street signs, whatever. I would not be shocked to find out that this is one of those cases, that maybe 502 was very much intentional. I also hesitate, again, we, we talked a little bit earlier in this episode about the whole, you know, Winter Soldier using the word homecoming in it. And every, so many people were totally convinced that there was a direct connection between, you know, Winter Soldier and Spider-Man homecoming and all that kind of, and obviously it wasn't. But I mean, that's a little thing like that anonymous that they could have thrown in there because they probably because they've done stuff like that before. So it might be. I doubt it points us to anything that is coming up. Whenever Disney has done these little things, they're just little homages, right? Like a little paying honor and tribute to and little neat Easter eggs. They're never meant as ooh seeds of hints and clues as to what is to come, right? They've never used them that way. But it, it could very well be an homage to that comic issue. Good catch, man. I'll make sure Rob knows about that. All right, next up, we got uh, Slick Saturn who writes, hey, uh, just some name ideas for the show. All right, here we go. Uh, the Frame, that's, that's not a terrible one. Uh, film Lexicon, nah. Off the Lens, nah. First Take, that's already a sports show. Uh, screen Shuffle, nah. Picture This, that's not bad. Establishing Shot, nah. Keeping Continuity, nah. Uh, tracking the Plot, no. Screen Source, no. The Morning Montage, no. Daily Call Sheet, no. Uh, cheers, y'all. Uh, there's a couple of those that aren't bad. There's a couple in there that, that aren't bad. Again, a, a lot of these ideas that I'm hearing from you guys are better than mine. Even if they're not ones I'm going to go with, they're still better than mine. Mine have been terrible. I, I've come up with just diff terrible ones. But there's a couple of there's a couple of possibilities in there, Slick Saturn. Thanks for giving some thought to it, man. I appreciate it. All right. Next up, Garden Variety Vagabond writes, Hey, John and Rob. About Echo, sadly, in interviews, I heard that much of her part was cut due to late changes related to COVID. I believe reshoots were needed, and one of the people in key scenes were unavailable, so they changed their storyline. Um, I haven't heard that. I mean, I heard some reshoots were needed. I heard some of the material had to be taken out. Here's my overall problem with Echo. My overall problem with Echo is not so much, is not that she didn't get enough screen time in Hawkeye. Just what they gave us of Echo, I did not find it all that interesting. And like reshoots and all that kind of stuff, notwithstanding, that's irrelevant. Are you writing this character in an interesting way so that whatever screen time they do have, it's compelling? We've seen many characters pop up that have had only like one or two scenes that we instantly found really compelling and we found ourselves being very interested in. And I found with Echo, and again, this is not the actress's fault. This is the writing. I just found they did not do a good job of making me interested and they didn't do much to make the character feel very compelling. So I have to confess that I'm not at all looking forward to the Echo show. Now that doesn't mean that the show won't be fantastic and I, and I will definitely check it out. And when it does start, maybe I'll think it's the best MCU show they've done so far, but I'd be lying to you if I told you I had any interest in it right now. And that's because they didn't do a good job writing this character. Because even if you reduced Echo down to two scenes, if you make the character compelling, we'll be interested. But, uh, you know, for me, Garden Variety just didn't work, unfortunately. So we'll see what happens once the show actually comes out. Maybe it'll be awesome. All right. Ethan Holgate writes, one of two. Hey, John and Rob, obviously just me today. Uh, I saw the unbearable weight of massive talent and I absolutely loved it. Uh, thought it was the perfect comedy for Nick Cage to take the piss out of himself. Uh, the acid trip sequence in the film had, well, again, I haven't seen it, so don't, I hope you're not spoiling a lot here. Uh, have you had a chance to see it? No. Uh, hopefully I'm going to go see it tonight. Uh, also, I'm a big fan of Charlie Sheen, and honestly, after watching this movie, not going to lie, I would love to see a piss take movie uh, like this involving Charlie Sheen, but doubt he would, or that would even happen, unfortunately, uh, but never know. Uh, no, I'd say absolute zero chance on a Charlie Sheen thing. Look, the, the difference between Charlie Sheen and Nicolas Cage is Nicolas Cage is recognized as one of the great actors of our generation. He's a multi-time Academy Award nominated, Academy Award winning actor. He is a fabulous actor and the world knows it. I mean, we've also known he's done a lot of crap over the past bunch of years, but 
he's an Academy Award winner. Charlie Sheen is not, um, nor was he ever close to anything like that. Charlie Sheen had an interesting career. I like hot. I love hot shots. I'm all about hot shots, but you know, he's a middling, uh, talented actor, not lower, but middling. He's a middling, talented actor. Who's really just, just known for his drama, especially in the last, you know, however many decades. So I would not be at all interested in that one bit. Nicolas Cage, though, is very unique in the world in that he is a world-class actor. He is a multi-time Academy-nominated, Academy Award-winning actor um, who's also like this wilder-than-reality personality. That I'm very excited about. So hopefully Ann and I get to keep our appointment because we do have our tickets for tonight. So hopefully we get to see that tonight. Thanks for adding that in, Ethan. All right, next up, Ethan also writes in, one or two. Also, John, separate question. Have you heard any news on when Guy Ritchie's new movie, Operation Fortune, is coming out? There's no release date for it yet, and the trailer for it came out not too long ago. My biggest assumption for why uh, there may not be a release date for it yet is because Deadline reported that Guy Ritchie is currently making another new film at the moment. So maybe they're waiting for him to be able to promote it. But I have no idea, though. Also, shout out to Ethan H., a fan who shouted me out. Um, yeah, so this this is an interesting looking one. I'm a big Guy Ritchie fan, right? I loved his recent movie, The Gentleman. I thought he did a great job on the Aladdin live action movie, like a terrific job on that. I'm a big fan of Lockstock and you know, uh, Snatch is in my top 20 favorite films of all time. I love Guy Ritchie. This is a, this trailer for um, Operation Fortune definitely looks like it has potential. Like you got uh, Jason Statham, who I actually absolutely love. Josh Bar Harnett, who we have not seen a lot of in the last while. Aubrey Plaza is in there. Um, even Carrie Yule's uh, Elwes, or however you pronounce his last name, from Princess Bride is in there as well. It looks like a quintessential Guy Ritchie film. Listen, the reason they haven't announced a release date has nothing to do with Guy Ritchie making another movie at the moment, right? These studios release their movies when they think their movies can make them the most money. Having the director on the press tour is not nearly as important as saying having Jason Statham on the press tour or having Aubrey Plaza on the press tour, right? Like those are much more important to them as far as press goes. But, and even if they wanted to wait till he was done, they that doesn't stop them from announcing a release date. They just would announce a release date that would be after he's done working on whatever movie he's working on right now. So I don't know why they haven't announced a release date. I haven't been following this film all that closely, although because it's a Guy Ritchie film, I am quite interested in it. But uh, I don't think it has anything to do with Guy Ritchie's current schedule. Unless the studio decided that movie needs a few reshoots and they got to wait until he's done that movie to come back and do some reshoots. But I haven't heard anything about that either. I'm just pulling that out of my ass. So we'll see, Ethan. Let's, let's just hold on tight and uh, see what Guy Ritchie's going to give us in this movie. All right, next up, we've got uh, Shy Potsy, who writes, one or two, hey, John and or Rob, just me today. If Rob, not Rob today, regarding my name of Shy Potsy, uh, no, it is unfortunately not a reference to what you thought it was. Wasn't that like, wasn't there a character named Potsy on like, I want to say, ha I mean, that was when I was a kid, but Happy Days or Laverne and Shirley or something. Anyway, uh, it's it's not a reference to what you thought it was. I'm sorry to disappoint. My question, or more of a thought actually, is what if Strucker from Age of Ultron is sort of a replacement of Stryker from Fox X-Men movies? I don't think there's any connection there. Considering the fact that they both experimented on mutants, well, technically Strucker didn't. Remember, in Age of Ultron, they were not mutants. Theoretically speaking. Anyway, considering the fact that they both experimented on mutants, but it was played off as illegal human experimentation in the MCU up to this point, I guess. Look at the parallels. Do I have a point? Well, you know, look, I I could see where you're going there. I could see where that's coming from. But honestly, I don't think there's any connection there whatsoever because these are two radically different characters, right? Stryker and Strucker are totally different types of characters with totally different types of backgrounds and frankly, totally different kinds of motivations. So I would guess that, well, again, I could see what you're looking at. I'm going to disagree with you on this one. I don't think there's a connection there, but that's, you never know, man. It's not impossible, Shy Potsy. Not impossible. All right. Next up, we've got uh, Lefty Donovan who writes, I just can't wait for BL Elvis movie. I watched a lot of Elvis growing up as my father was a huge fan. 
Austin Butler's performance and singing in this movie slash trailer look great. No one on watch list. Oh, number one on watch list, even though I generally like MCU and such movies. Listen, this Elvis trailer dropped. And first of all, a movie by Boz Lerman is going to get you excited. The fact that you got Tom Hanks in there as the Colonel is really exciting. But this trailer was fantastic. And when I found out that this kid is actually doing all the singing, very impressed. Um, I know that it's playing at some festival stuff right now. And the early reactions I'm hearing are really through the roof. So I'm with you, Lefty Donovan. I am extremely excited for this Elvis movie. And I cannot wait to watch it, man. Thanks for writing that in. Okay, next up, we got Mike G who writes, I've been buying Silver Age Fantastic Four comics, and the utter gobsmacking brilliance of this comic has been crushed with only bad movies. Thoughts and hopes for the upcoming MCU flick? Well, I mean, yeah, first of all, I think, I mean, he's not here to correct me, unfortunately, but I, I think like those Golden Age Fantastic Four comics, I think those might have been John Schnepp's favorite comics of all time. Um, that being said, yeah, they have tried many times to make a Fantastic Four movie and different versions of it. And each one has had its various levels of potential, um, but none of them have lived up to the potential of what they could be. And it just kind of goes to prove that, listen, everybody thinks making movies is easy. Everybody just assumes that because they've seen some really great movies, that, oh, that means it's simple. It's simple. Oh, it's Fantastic Four. It's easy to make a good movie. No, it's not. It's ridiculously hard because some really great, talented people have tried making those movies and it's always ended up as a dud. A lot of people have a lot of hope pinned on the fact that Kevin Feige has announced that they're doing a Fantastic Four movie. And a lot of people are getting their expectations really high. And if anybody's going to do it right, it's going to be Feige with his team at Marvel for sure. So let's see if the first family of comics can actually get their due when it comes to the motion pictures. Thanks for writing that in, Mike G. Appreciate that, man. All right, next up, Dr. Nova writes, Unbearable weight of massive talent, a great meta movie, which correctly identified the third greatest movie of all time. Top three best movies are my favorite movie about time. Your favorite movie, Paddington 2. Yeah, listen, some, I talked about this on the John Campy show the other day. Somebody sent me a clip. They released a, a promo clip for the unbearable weight of massive talent where uh, Nick Cage and Pedro Pascal are talking. And it starts with Nick Cage like ta saying, and you guys can look this up on YouTube saying, quit dodging the question. Just answer me. What is your third favorite movie of all time? And Pedro Pascal goes, Paddington 2. And Nicholas is like, what? That's ridiculous. I can be Paddington 2. Then like smash cuts to the two of them sitting on a couch, clearly watching Paddington 2. And Nick Cage is crying and they're weeping. It's like, you're right. This is the third greatest movie of all time. Whatever. I have been an advocate for the Paddington movies for a long time. Paddington won. I remember I just mentioned Schnepp. Schnepp and I went to go see the first Paddington. No expectations. Blown away by how good that movie was. Paddington 2 may have even been better. It's 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 essentially it's a perfect movie. Paddington 2. It's joyous. It's heartwarming. It's delightful. It just delivers such a great. It's, it's a fantastic movie. Mm. And I'm sick and tired of all these losers who've never watched it, kind of dissing the movie. You've never even seen it. Well, I don't need to see Paddington 2 to know it's just for kids. Listen, shut up. You don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Paddington 2 is a masterpiece, and I'm glad to see that unbearable weight of massive talent is paying some homage and some honor to this great movie. Anyway, thanks for sending that in, Dr. Nova. Uh, Dr. Nova also writes, my top five favorite movies are, one, About Time. Oh, that's the one with Donald Gleason. Donald Gleason, I should say. And uh, good Canadian kid, Rachel McAdams. That, that's a solid little, like, I'm not big on time travel movies. Everybody knows this. That's one of the more interesting ones. That's one of the more interesting ones. Uh, two, Wolf Children. I must admit, I don't know what we're, I don't, I'm not, I don't think I'm familiar with that movie, with Wolf Children. Number three, Paddington 2. Number four, The Mask of Zorro, really. And number five, 1408. That's the John Cusack, Samuel Jackson little horror movie. I'm not going to lie. I was disappointed with that movie. I mean, I, I love John Cusack and I love Samuel Jackson. So when that movie's coming out, like this thriller horror, psychological, supernatural thriller horror thing, I was actually really, really interested in it. I, I, I'm not going to lie to you. I was kind of let down by it by myself, but you loved it. And that's the important thing. All fellow subjective, man. Thanks for sharing your list with the doc. All right, next up. We got Jeremy who tips in $20. Thank you, Jeremy, for supporting our channel on that level, man. Uh, Jeremy writes, 
I just wanted to thank you for always encouraging your viewers to chase their dreams. I am getting close to finishing my first novel. That is awesome. And I've really enjoyed the process. Dude, listen, I remember, first of all, almost everybody says at some point that they want to write a, write a book. But here's the funny thing is anybody can. You just have to do it. And that's where everybody fails. Nobody gets started. Nobody wants to take on the journey. Everybody wants to go, wants the destination. Very few people want the journey. And it took me five years to do my book. Five years. Not because it's one of the great epic masterpieces, just because that's how long it took me. A lot of, some people can write a novel in two weeks, but I, I don't have that in me, obviously. Hmm. So number one, I am super impressed that you undertook that yourself. And I am very, very excited for you. That you're, nothing feels better than when you finish. Nothing feels better than when you finish. So congratulations on that, Jeremy. That is awesome that you did that. And I hope it turns out really well for you, man. All right. Next up, BK Dan writes, John slash Rob, just John today. Uh, in my opinion, Felipe should be voiced by Tom, Aaron's Tom. Uh, show name suggestions. Entertainments are us? No. Uh, media munchers? Definitely no. Uh, the entertainment panel? No. Cine talkers? Eh, I don't want anything with Cine in it. And screen silver and small. Screens silver and small? Nah, I don't think I'm digging any of those, BK. But I'll tell you what. I love the idea. If I do someday a Felipe, the sentient dancing microphone movie... Uh, Tom Degnan, who is, of course, our own Aaron Cummings' husband and a, and a really great actor in his own right, uh, he would be a great guy to do the voice. I wouldn't mind that at all. Uh, thank you for the suggestion on that, BK. All right, next up, Trevor Summers writes, after two years of COVID disruption, I finally get to see My Chemical Romance next month in Milton Ke uh, Ke Kenny's. Uh, I'm taking my girlfriend, Julie. She slept through the Batman. Uh, wine will do that before going to the cinema. No way she's sleeping through this. Bless. I'm not going to lie. I couldn't tell you one song by Chemical Romance. I mean, I'm not dissing the band. I'm, I'm saying I couldn't tell you a single song that they do. I just don't know. But if you're excited about it, that's the important thing. And hey, listen, at least your girlfriend was willing to go to the Batman with you. I'm sure there's a lot of guys out there that would have loved their girlfriends to go with them to that and probably didn't work, to, maybe didn't have a lot of interest in going and wouldn't go. Yours did. So I still say you're one up on the game, Trevor. And I hope you guys have a fantastic time at the concert, wherever Milton Keenis is, wherever that is. I hope you have a great time, friend. All right. Next up, we got Sempigar writes in. So many great movies slash messages, diversity of characters, ages, and races that come from Disney slash Pixar films. Onward, Soul, Turning Red, Coco, Encanto, Moana, Zootopia, Wally, -E, Inside Out, Luca, Up, Brave, Raya, and The Last Dragon, etc. I love it. No, listen, Disney has done a really good job, especially over the last couple of years, about making movies reflecting the world we live in. And when I say reflecting the world we live in, I don't mean Ryan the Last Dragon, but the people and characters who inhabit them are more of a reflection of the world that we live in than the, what they used to do. Now, look, they they understandably faced some criticism before because like the first 20 MCU movies all had like white male leads. They were all, I mean, they're all magnificent. You know, I love those, the MCU movies completely. But if somebody was to point at them with a criticism, they wouldn't be far off to say, um, totally the same, like every single one, white male lead, white male lead, 20 in a row, 20 in a row. Now, I don't believe for a second that Disney had any kind of white male lead only agenda. It's just that those were the movies they were making, but it does. I'm not going to lie. It makes me chuckle when, you know, I, I see some basement dwellers like, like complain about, oh, Disney's got like this anti-men agenda. I'm like, dude, they made 20 movies in a row with nothing but white male leads. And nobody said they had an agenda. But all of a sudden now that they've made a couple of projects with female leads, they're like, oh, it's just all anti-men agenda. Can you imagine how much these people's brains would melt if Disney, say, came out and did 20 black female-led movies in a row? If Disney came out and did 20 black female lead movies in a row, these people would have a nuclear meltdown in the brains, right? They would instantly scream agenda. And at 20 in a row, you could point to that. But 
but then but they had no problem at all with Marvel doing 20 movies in a row with all white male leads. Oh, that's fine. That's perfectly. There's no agenda there. That's perfectly fine. And I I agree. There was no agenda there. That's fine. But just because they're now diversifying and they're making movies with characters that are a more accurate representation of the world we live in, there are some people who just can't handle that. And their dicks shrivel, not that they were very big to begin with, and they get all insecure. It's like, oh, and they, and they do what insecure babies do. They lash out. And it's just kind of crazy. But I've never once had anybody... You know, come after me when I when I explain like when, oh, they made the third project with a female lead. Oh, they're all anti-men now. It's like, well, were they anti-women when they made 20 white male lead movies in a row? No, that wasn't anti-women. That is just making their movies. So how come them making some movies now and some projects with some female leads? That's an agenda. But when it's men, it's not an agenda. Look. I'm cool if they put out 15 movies in a row with white male leads. I'm cool if they put out 10 movies in a row with black female leads. I just want good movies. And if they can do that while also representing the world we live in more accurately, awesome. But too many people come to these things with political agendas. And if it doesn't fit their political agenda, they reject it and make up all these cutesy little bullshit slang terminologies for it. And it's like, ah, yeah, 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 whatever. But it is what it is. You're right. It should be celebrated that they make these movies. And make them in such a way that they are more accurately representing the world and the, and the audiences who watch these movies. So I agree with you, Senpai Gar. All right, next up. Garden Variety Vagabond writes, John Rob, just John, uh, let me recommend, especially for Ray, Kimi on HBO Max. It has an interesting premise that is very much in the zeitgeist, a mix on how we are impacted by both COVID and our technology, such as Siri. But best of all, it is a tight 89 minutes. I have never even heard of this thing. Give me one second here. Let me look up, see if I can see what we're talking about here. Okay, this is the one that's got Zoe Kravitz is directed by Steven Swoberg. Okay, so we have talked about this movie uh, before, but I, I wasn't familiar with what it was before and I totally forgot about it. So Kimi, okay. All right, I like hearing that. Zoe Kravitz, of course, just killed it as Catwoman on uh, in The Batman. So, all right, man, I will. Thank you for putting that back on my radar. I appreciate that very much, Garden Variety. I will make sure I check that out. Thank you, dude. Okay, next up. Garden Variety also writes, one of two. John, for your new show name, more show name recommendations, it should definitely have the concept of community. I was thinking on the working for a post. I was thinking on the working for a post when I went back in forth on if I should use you discussed or we discussed uh, and realized that that is what separates you from the pack. You have created a community where others just share information. The virtual water cooler suggestion would definitely meet that concept. Well, thank you so much for that recommendation, Garden, and thank you for the commentary. Listen, I, yeah, one of the things I try to do with our show is try to make it as community focused as possible. I mean, that's why we spend so much time uh, doing mailbags and taking super chats and, and you know, the very fact that even our main topics we take from you guys, you guys send us our main topics. So you know, what? why don't I bring this up here? And uh, just so we can talk about it now how you get, you know, all of our main topics on the John Campus show also come from the community. And if you want to send in a main topic for the community, uh, all you have to do is go to www.thejohncampionshow.com slash contact. Now, once you get there, you're going to see a form. Fill it out with your topic question. It is absolutely free. Uh, send it all in, and then you might see your submission featured as one of the main topics on the show. Now, here's a couple of tips. If you want to send in something to be a main topic on the show, don't make it a general question like, Hey, John, do you like X-Men? You know, that's not going to be a main topic on the show. What we're looking for is when you come across big topics or big issues or big stories that you think we should cover on the show. So don't, don't write it like we'll never do as a main topic. John, who are your five favorite Avengers? Like that's not going to be a main topic on the show. So when you guys come across like a big issue or story out there, fire it on in. And you may see your thing taken. But yeah, that's the thing. I, I like to base everything that we do on the show as being community driven, whether it's our main topics, our super chats, mailbags, stuff like that. We try to make it all community driven, like all of it comes from you guys. And um, and that is a big thing. How we can work that into a title for our show, I'm not sure, but I will keep my eyes on that. Thanks for writing that in, Garden. Next up, we've got... Uh, King Tantic, I just had to turn on one of my lights here, guys. Uh, King Tantic writes, 
April 15th was the 110th anniversary of the Titanic sinking. I did not realize that. Um, in honor, I watched my favorite film of all time last week, Titanic, a true masterwork in handling a sensitive event with such majesty and grace. What are your thoughts on the movie? It's, it's fantastic. No, I, I get it. It's the cool thing. Like, you know, it's cool. To say, oh, Titanic was so dumb. It's everybody thinks they're cool for saying that. Titanic is a masterpiece. It is a masterpiece in filmmaking. It's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful movie. And it ages very well. I mean, not all the effects. Some of the effects don't, you know, stand up to the test of time. But the, the movie itself, it's brilliantly directed, brilliantly told. Because I remember, too, like thinking, how can you make an interesting movie out of, okay, it's a boat that sinks. How do you make a, like a full damn movie out of that? Like, what's, what's the point of that? But they did it, man. They made a terrific movie out of it, and I think it's utterly a fantastic film. I, I don't have it like in my top 10 greatest of all time, but I think it's a masterpiece of a movie. And there's a reason that it's like the third highest grossing film of all time after all these years. Uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. All right, next up, we've got Tim who writes, Hey, John and crew. Over under 50%, we get an appearance from Famke Jansen or potentially Sophie Turner as Jean Grey in Doctor Strange 2. Uh, Jean versus Wanda would be absolutely badass. Love the show and thanks for all you do. All right. I disagree that uh, Wanda versus Jean would be good because it, there'd be no story. See, listen, to me, these types of big action sequences or whatever, these are only interesting if they're tied to story and narrative, right? Right. Just having, oh, Jean Grey suddenly pops up and now her and Wanda are going to fight. Like, that's no better than like a Street Fighter watching a clip of Street Fighter. It's like, oh, Ryu versus, you know, uh, what's one of the other guy's name? Who's the sumo wrestler's name? I can't even remember. But I'm not going to say Ken because that's too stereotypical. Ryu versus whoever. Right. It's like, OK, but that doesn't make a good movie. That's not good story. So unless the character was going to be in the movie enough to create a, some dramatic purpose, whatever, then the fight would just be a eh, visual noise to me. I think it's a very, very small chance. I'm not saying zero. I'm not saying zero, but I think it's a relatively small chance that we see either of them. But I love I, I, I never know if I'm saying her name right, by the way, but uh, Famke. Anyway, I'm probably pronouncing her name wrong, but Famke Jansen, I think she's been one of the most underrated individuals in all of comic book movies history. I think she's great. And I've never seen her in a lot of stuff outside of that. And obviously, you know, she did the Taken stuff and whatever, but I, I don't know why she's not a true A-list star, to be honest with you. But I, I don't actually think there's a big chance that she appears in this, although she did pull out an appearance in X-Men Days of Future Past, I believe. Yeah, at the end, right? So, I mean, who knows? You, you never know, Tim. All right, next up. Spoon Knight writes, one of two. Moon Knight has been uh, hinting at a third personality. We've also seen Steven as Mr. Knight while using Conchu's power instead of Moon Knight. In the comics, Mark has a brother who also gains the powers of Khonshu and becomes the villain Shadow Knight. Uh, the show hasn't suggested Mark has any siblings, but they have hinted this other personality is much stabbier. <laughs> Do you think Mark could share a body with Shadow Knight or a version of it? Might be a stretch, but could be an interesting take. Thanks. All right. Thanks for saying that in. I'm going to say, I mean, that's an interesting theory, Spoon Knight. That's a really interesting theory. I'm going to say the more obvious answer uh, and go along with most other people who think it's probably going to be Jake. Because remember, it's there. It's absolute 100% that there's a third personality, right? Like when Mark wakes up and realizes all these guys have been stabbed, it's like, Stephen, what did you do? It seems like it wasn't me. Clearly, there's a third personality. They In the last episode, when they, they see the sarcophagus that somebody else is trying to bust out, well, that's, I think, the third personality. I think everybody else is right, and that's going to be Jake. But, Spoon Knight, you've just raised a really interesting theory. I kind of wish Rob was here right now. He might be able to shed some insight on this. I like the theory. Let's keep our eyes on it and see what they do. All right, next up. Lewis Hall writes, Hey, John, now that Spider-Man has come and gone, what were the two juicier photos uh, that you didn't post? Uh, again, somebody else brought that up earlier in the thing. Again, I am never going to reveal that until after. Remember, the two pictures I didn't post, turns out they were not from Spider-Man No Way Home, which totally freaked me and Rob out because we knew, well, that means it could only be from blah, blah, blah. 
Uh, and once blah, blah, blah comes out, then I will reveal what those pictures were. Once everybody's had a chance to see it. And then, then I'll say, by the way, that thing and the thing we just watched, that's what that picture was from. Just so you guys know. All right. Next up, Teddy D writes, uh, Seattle or settle, sorry, settle a bar argument with my friend group. How would you rank the Skarsgård brothers? Uh, Alex gets all of the attention, but Gustav's best uh, Vikings Westworld. And don't forget, he did that one show that was on HBO or was on Netflix where he played Merlin. Uh, I can't remember the name of the show, but he played Merlin. He was actually quite good in that. And I love Miss Floki in Vikings. And Bill's Horror Chops, um, It, Nine Days, Castle Rock, are so underrated. Um, listen, the whole clan Skarsgård is great. Going right up to, obviously, the king of them all, Stellan, their, the dad. But Alexander could win Academy Awards. I, I expect he will. He can do everything from the Northmen to um, what was the what was the show that they did? Damn, uh, Dirty Little Lies, or uh, now I got to look it up. What's the damn thing called? Big Little Lies, <laughs> Big Little Lies, which was kind of neat because the Northman was kind of a Big Little Lies reunion because in Big Little Lies, um, Skarsgård, Alexander Skarsgård and Nicole Kidman were, were married and in here they were mother and uh, son. So kind of a brain twist there. But yeah, to me, it's it's easy. Alexander Skarsgård, probably by a mile, though uh, the other brothers definitely have futures ahead of them too. So let's see where that goes. Thanks for writing that in, Teddy. Okay, next up, The Sock writes. Saw everything everywhere all at once, and the bagel part got me. Again, I'm not going to go into details because a lot of people haven't seen it yet. There's a skit on YouTube that took a similar approach, so seeing that just had me dying. I mean, listen, there are a number of fabulous moments represented by different types of objects that just makes everything everywhere all at once, like I said, the best movie I've seen this year uh, so far. Still a lot of great movies to come this year, but right now it is the number one movie of the year to me. It is so creative, so bonkers, so crazy, but so beautiful and emotional all at the same time. I'm glad you saw it, Sock. Most, more of you got to get out and see it as well. All right. The Sock also writes, me explaining on Reddit why Netflix can't allow password sharing. It's not possible. The subreddit. Why isn't it possible, you stupid bastard? Me. It's just not. I know. Listen, we all want everything for free. We want everything given to us for free. And when somebody doesn't give us something for free, we think they're the ones with the problem. Netflix is not designed to be a free service. They spend billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars every year to operate. And they can't operate and they can't be profitable and they can't stay in existence if people just steal it. And Listen, you got to understand, like, I hear people make these semantic arguments all the time trying to justify behavior, but the reality is this, when something is made and created for the intent of sale and you find a way, way to take it without paying for it, that's stealing. Just is. You can play your word games all you want, but it's stealing. When somebody creates a song and they pour their life and whatever to it and they spent years building their craft and get to the point they create a song and it's meant for sale. But you find a way to go and take it without paying for it, that's stealing. And while Netflix for a long time kind of turned a bit of a blind eye to the idea of, you know, sharing passwords and all that kind of stuff, it's now biting them in the ass. They figure almost 50% well, I mean, depending on which side of the math you're looking at, but they're saying they, they think up to 100 million people may be using Netflix without it being properly paid for, right? Or being used the way it's intended. So yes, and, and now Netflix is, they lost $54 billion overnight because their stock dropped, because their subscriber thing's going. Listen, when you're dropping, you know, you drop 200,000 subscribers and you realize there's probably 100 million people out there using it wrongly and using it illegally, then you got to crack down on that or else you're going to go out of business real quick. So yeah, uh, there's that. All right. Next up, uh, Harry Poppins writes, I was recently at Jersey Mike subs uh, the other day and heard the infamous dirt on my boots. Country music is not for me. I 
it's funny because I've had a few people sending me links to things. Because we told the story about this one time I was in Vegas and the song Dirt on My Boots came out and everything, right? And a lot of people never heard of it, but ever but then people went hunting for it and they found it. So you found it at Mike Subs. By the way, they make a great um what what sub is it there that I get Ann to get me every time? Is it a is it a Philly cheesesteak? Yeah, that's what it is. Jersey Mike's has a great Philly cheesecake, uh, cheesecake, a great Philly cheese steak uh, sandwich that I love, but I can only order it like once or twice a year because it like I get completely stuffed and I feel sick. But oh my God, it's so good. Anyway, uh, last question of the day comes to us from Keg uh, Kramshi, who writes, your talk on first movie dates with significant others made me want to share mine. Me and my lady went to the premiere of Halloween 2018 at the Chinese. Nice. And watched the movie with Jamie Lee. That is awesome. She's so lovely. Great date. That is a great date. And by the way, Jamie Lee Curtis also in, she's one of the key characters in uh, Everything Everywhere All at Once. If you want to see a really good movie with Jamie Lee Curtis, go see Everything Everywhere All at Once. Like I said, again, it is the number one movie of the year, in my opinion. That does sound like a great date, man. And thank you for sharing your experience with it. And guys, that'll do it. For this episode of Mailbag, thank you so much for being here and making this show part of your day. Again, this is the very first video on the channel that is made from the new office. Again, we're just in my my private office. The studio is through that door. The studio is not ready for us to record on yet. So I'm just recording this in here. Tomorrow's The John Campy Show will also be shot from in here. And Rob will be in his office. And you'll see us side by side. We're going to do it old school that way because, again... Through that door, the main studio is not quite yet ready. But we will be back again tomorrow. Guys, thank you so much for being here and making this show part of your day. Special thank you to all you guys who sent in those questions. Number one, because you gave us great fun things to talk about. But number two, you supported this channel as you did it. And all of us involved with the John Campus Show, thank you guys so much for your support. Okay, guys. Don't forget, uh, some of you guys are going to watch this a little bit early. Maybe become a channel member, guys. You get access to these videos a little bit earlier than everybody else does. I also put up a great behind-the-scenes studio tour of it still in progress for our channel members. It's up there right now. If you are a channel member, you haven't seen that yet, it is up there and available for you to see. So, guys, come back and join us again tomorrow. That'll do it for us for now, guys. Thanks a lot for being here. My name's John Campia, and until next time, my friends, dirt on my boots.